welcome to our service for the first Sunday of Advent. Advent is when we remember the long waiting of the ancient people of God, ancient Israel, as they waited for God to keep his promise to send the Messiah. And we also look forward to uh, his keeping of all of his promises when the Messiah comes again. Please stand and sing with us now. sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wage the land. You come to the help of those who gladly do right who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. 
Oh, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people.
Oh, 
shaken. Um, today is the first day of Advent. So, yay! Um, we're going through, for those of us who are interested, we're going through Kate Bowler's uh, free digital devotional together called The Advent We Actually Have, which um, is available via the URL that's on the PDF form of our Advent handout. It's so, also written on that. If you just type so, it right, you could type this in like an animal. Or you can just open up the PDF that Justin has emailed, and you'll be able to get access to that. And it starts today, so um, join in if you're interested. And if you don't start today and you need a couple of days to catch up, that's okay too. But we would love to participate and love to hear your reflections. And we'll probably have a couple of like tables at our next lunch where we can talk about it together. Um, other things that are going on today, today is potluck, yay! Also communion, yay! Um, today is an Advent communion, which we'll talk more about when you see me again for communion. Um, and stick around for potluck, and then if you're able to, if, you're, if you can stick around, we're putting up the tree and all of the like greenery today, and then next week we will decorate, so there will be pot <coughs> Um, also, note, no Bible study for Daniel for the month of December. You can show up here on Wednesday, but no one will be here. So, probably don't. Um, but, again, totally up to you. Other things that are going on next week, while well, I guess everybody else is decorating, the church council will have a final meeting of the year. Um, we didn't really plan that one super well. Um, yeah, so if you're on the church council, or if you are coming to join the church council, which we now have our two new members for next year, which is going to be Steve Otto and Matt Hartain. So if you wish to join in to kind of see what it's about, you're welcome to. He said he would. He said he would. <laughs> I mean, we can adjust it. But as of right now, it's the two of them. Um, if you want to join in, you're welcome to, or you can just wait till January. Totally up to you. Anyway, that's happening next week. Uh, other things that are going on, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday, so there will not be a Sunday service. Instead, we're moving our lessons and carol service to be at 5 p.m. here on Christmas Eve, which is a Sunday, after which we will have dinner together and also cookies, because we will bring cookies, because it's Christmas Eve on a Sunday at 5 p.m. Lessons and carols. Got it? And then the other thing that's not on here is that December 31st is also going to be a communion Sunday. It's going to be our Christmas communion, so just FYI on that one. Um, Tanya. I just wanted to say something about lessons and carols. Um, when we first moved here 14 years ago, um, I had never been to a Christmas Eve service. Our church didn't ever do that. So um, I was in the throes of getting ready for Christmas on Christmas Eve. And I had to stop <clears throat> and get dressed and go to this Christmas Eve service. And my thought was, whose bright idea was this? <laughs> but it has become my favorite service. Yeah. It, it is so meaningful and so special. And to see the church at night all lit up mm -hmm. and then to do the candles. Which is still and, will be at five. Because it's December. <laughs> 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 so, they, I just wanted you all to know. Yeah. It's one of my favorite services of the year, too. Mm -hmm. And um, it's always good to be able to relive and go back through the story of the birth of Christ. Justin? Um, I wanted to uh, announce about Angel Tree. Um, we've uh, finished with collecting all the, the gifts and clothes and things that we're going to be giving uh, to uh, some kids from the county for Angel Tree. Um, this year, I believe it was eight uh, children that our church was able to help out with. And so um, thank you to everyone who helped with, with shopping or um, getting bags and, and presents and also with donating or, or encouraging us to do it. Um, it's always um, a good thing that we can do to give back to the community. So uh, that's wrapping up and we'll be dropping those off this Thursday or Friday to social services. So. Um, yeah, thanks again, and your your donations are, are being put to good use. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, so because it's communion service today, I won't be doing the normal um, prayer and praise time up front, but please, when you gather around the tables together, pray for each other, celebrate with each other. Um, we know particularly to be praying for Gwen, who's recovering from her surgery, and just, she's up and moving, which is awesome, but like it, recovery from surgery is always a little tricky. So be praying for her. Any other announcements? How's Crystal? 
with which Kristen? Crystal. 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 Yeah. Um, she got her Crystal. one cast, and now she's in another cast, and she got her stitches out. Okay. So oh, she's progress. Being, and I'm hoping maybe she will be mobile enough maybe next Sunday. That would be awesome. So she, yeah. says, she said she loves you all, she misses you, and she wants to come back. So I'm kind of waiting for a doctor's permission before we... Excellent. Yeah. Definitely be praying for that permission, because I'm sure it's yeah. not been fun for her to be on her own for so long. Any other announcements, questions? Over to Justin. Um, I think the youths are going with Tanya. Tanya is Like to share with the whole class? I'm saying no So, um, as I mentioned earlier, our sermon this week will be coming from the Old Testament reading that Matt did, Isaiah 64, 1 through 9. It's in your order of service uh, from the New International Version. Good news first, and the bad news first. Bad news. I hate it when people ask that. They always say, I've got good news and I've got bad news. Or do you want the good news first and the bad news first? I don't know about you, but when people ask about that first, before they start saying whatever they're going to say, any good news that they're going to say is negated for me because now I know that there's something bad, and so I'm waiting for that. So either they're going to say that first, and then my mind's going to be on the bad news, or they're going to say it second, but I'm going to spend the whole good news time thinking about the bad news that's coming. And when people say, I have good news and I have bad news, they're usually not equal. Mm -hmm. the, the good news is usually not as good as the bad news that they have. Um, so it's usually like, well, the bad news is your transmission is shot. But the good news is we caught it in time and it only cost you $2,000. Like it's never, it's never, the good news is, oh, but they're giving away free transmissions this week or something like that. It's never equal. It's always um, something that doesn't outweigh it. So I never like that. But uh, Advent actually does start with bad news. Um, but it, it starts with bad news because uh, we actually need a little bit of a shakeup because we're generally fairly good at pretending that things aren't bad. Um, Advent, uh, as you know, is the season when we're uh, looking back on God's ancient promises and how he kept those 2,000 years ago by sending Christ to be born. Uh, but we're also looking forward to, as so the word Advent uh, just means arrival or coming. We're looking forward to God's coming. And um, as always happens with, with big holidays, especially ones that involve buying things. Christmas kind of creeps outward, and I love Christmas, and I like, you know, the, the lights and the music and all that. It's great, and, and that's all fine, um, but Christmas, unstopped by anything else, will creep outward until, you know, June, if you let it, and um, especially with, as, as the stores get more and more desperate to sell something. So Black Friday used to be just the day after Thanksgiving. I don't know if you noticed, but Black Friday sales started a week before Thanksgiving this year. I don't know. But um, Christmas season is wonderful, but if you can hold off on that for just a little while, Advent lets you sharpen your anticipation for that. So that Christmas, meaning of Christmas is really heightened and um, enhanced because there's, you know why the good news is good, because you've been able to admit the bad news. So Advent always starts with a really downer Sunday which is sometimes very hard, especially if it's the Sunday right after Thanksgiving. Everybody's just barely finished the leftovers, and you're like, stuff is bad. Um, but that's actually how it is. Advent starts not with a shout of excitement or with you know the Christmas morning sparkle or anything like that. Advent starts with a groan or a moan or a admission that things are bad. And so that's what this passage in Isaiah does. It's one of the, one of the deepest laments, um, one of the deepest times when the community of faith expresses their longing for God. And it's really stark language. If you were listening, when, when Matt read through it, um, 
They're begging God to show up. And they're saying, we don't know where you are. We've heard stories of the things you used to do. It says, um, uh, you, you used to do awesome things that we did not expect since ancient times. We, we heard stories from our parents and our grandparents about the good old days when, when God used to do amazing things. But we don't see that right now. We feel like we're living in the aftermath when the good stuff has ended and it's just bleak, they're saying. And then they say, we really wish that you would come down and break open the heavens, like crack open this world and, and show up in an awesome way that would terrify the evil people and the wicked people and your enemies and like set them ablaze. So it starts out with this, this plea for God to just come down swinging, you know, with both fists. But then as they start to complain and start to admit to God honestly that things are not good, they say, you come to the help of those who gladly do right and who remember your ways, those who do the right things and live right. And that's when they have to admit that they themselves would be in trouble. If God really comes down with justice, if God comes to swing that hammer, to swing that sword of justice, they're going to be in trouble too. Because they said, but we've continued in our sins for a long time. You're actually angry at us too. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean and our righteous acts are like filthy rags. So they're saying, you know, we, we like to put on a good costume of, of looking like we're doing pretty well and looking like we're doing a few good things and pointing to those and hoping that God or everybody else will look at those and ignore the bad things that we do. But he says, even those are bloody and muddy and nobody is fooled, least of all God by all the, the smiles that we put on and the good deeds that we occasionally do at Christmas, hoping to outweigh the rest of the year. Then it says, we shrivel up like a leaf. So we just finished that season of the year when all the leaves are shriveling and falling. And you walk through them and they're all just crunching and crumbling underfoot. And they easily blow away in the wind. That's this image. There's no life in the people. They're, there's no sap. There's no greenness and life. They're saying we're like a leaf that is crumbled up and blown away. Like the wind, our sins sweep us away. We have no strength. We say we do, but now is the time to be honest. We don't have any strength. And our, the wind is much stronger than the leaf, right? And the wind is sweeping us away. We've all, we all made our resolutions. We all said back in January what we're going to do, and Advent is the time, actually February is the time, but Advent is the time when we admit that those resolutions did not do well. We said that we're going to be like a mighty tree. No, you're like a dead leaf, and the wind is much stronger than you, and it's sweeping you away. And then they, they come to the bottom of it. They say, nobody calls on your name. Nobody, nobody worships you right or strives to lay hold of you. Nobody's really trying anymore. <coughs> and then most horrifying thing of all, they say, you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. They say, are you even still there? Are you, did you get so angry and fed up with the world that you did what probably some of us want to do and just be like, Phew. no, and give up and turn your back on us and give up after giving a second, third, and eight millionth chances? You You've turned away from us. We don't even know where you are anymore. You've given us up to our sins. Advent starts by stripping away all the pretense and saying, things are not good. Things are not good. And we ask God to do something about it. We remember that he did something once, but honestly, that's been 2,000 years. And so it's a time to be honest and say, we've heard stories from those before us of powerful things that you did, and we've, we've heard stories in your lives, or we, you might remember something that happened to us 10 years ago or five years ago, but now's now. And we, we say, God, why don't you crack open the, the staleness of life and the suffering of life and the just one thing after another of life? Why don't you crack that open and show yourself with power and salvation? As we read the news and we see that once again, this Christmas, you know, every, every 
Advent, you know, we talk about the coming of the Prince of Peace, and I, I always look around, and there's always wars going on. And once again, this year, there are again. There are people suffering. My friend, who's a pastor in the West Bank, a Palestinian Christian, said that they're not going to have Christmas celebrations in, in his church in Bethlehem because he felt, they felt like they couldn't. Too many of them have lost relatives in this war, and it would be a slap in the face. They're going to have a Christmas service, but they're not decorating. They're not putting up lights. They're just barely hanging in there and, and putting up food packages together. But it doesn't even take looking at the, at the stories of war. I mean, you look at stories closer to home. I was reading a, a story in the newspaper just the other day about how many people in this country are struggling with what they're going to do with themselves or their spouses or their parents as they age and uh, experience mental, mental or physical decline. And it's really hard to find um, home health aids or, or good places for people to live. And people are in desperate situations and, and scrambling and trying to put together resources. And they were talking about how many people are living these quiet lives of desperation, uh, working three jobs and caring for an aging relative or parent or something. And many of us are in that situation or know that of that situation. And then of course there's just all the everyday stuff. We, we put down the phone after talking to another friend who's making a stupid decision. Or we, we roll our eyes at a story of another person who's crashed their life. Or we we stand at the bedside of someone who's suffering with illness and pain for seemingly no purpose. And we say, God, where are you? Why don't you come down and do something about this? But we also know, like the people who prayed this prayer, that it's not quite as simple as that. If, if God really shows up, he doesn't just show up and do just, like, just the, exactly the things you want to do. Like He doesn't sort of zap the people you want and then leave everything untouched and, and fine in your life. As the prayer from uh, 2 Peter said that we read, in the day of the Lord, it comes like a thief. It comes unexpectedly, and it comes with fire. And so there is this hesitancy where, for some of us, it's easier to distract ourselves, which, honestly, in December, is very easy. <laughs> There's like, everybody is bringing to every office and gathering and party, like, more candy and baked goods than you could possibly eat. And then, and there's, you know, there's food and there's drink and there's, uh, fun and there's things to distract yourself with and those are fine. I, I love all those things can be good But they can also be ways to avoid saying Wow, this world is not what it should be. My life is not what it should be Even the good things that I do are very tainted and I'm not full of life I'm crumpled <coughs> up inside like a old dry leaf But that's where the the passage Turns in a really unexpected way. So they started out saying Come on, God, why don't you come down here and just, you know, clean up this mess and blast everybody? But then they, they stop and they say, well, we know we don't deserve that, really. But then they, they turn and they say, we can't rely on our good deeds to fix this. We can't rely on our best efforts or ideas to fix this. So what are we going to rely on? God's love and faithfulness and relationship with us. So it says, yet you, Lord, are our Father. God has created us and committed to being like a parent, like a father to us. But better than any father or authority figure that we've ever experienced because they don't abuse, they don't misuse their authority, they don't give up on us, they don't abandon us. We are the clay. You are the potter. In other words, make us into what you want. Shape us, shape our lives into what you want them to be. We are the work of your hand. So don't be angry beyond measure. Do not remember our sins forever. So they appeal to God's mercy and his relationship with us when all else fails. They say, look on us, we pray, for we are all your people. Advent is a time to say, we will not be fixed by the next technological innovation, we will not be fixed by the next um, new kind of crypto coin that comes out. We will not be fixed by uh, the next good 12 ideas for being a better you or decluttering your life book that comes along. As good as all those things can be, well, except for crypto, that's just totally. 
<laughs> yeah, you're gonna lose all your money. You're gonna lose all your money. Um, we're not gonna be saved by our, our New Year's resolution. We're not gonna be saved by being more religious. We're not gonna be fixed by anything that's here. We need something else. As the, the poem that I quoted every Advent, it's still the best poem, um, Auden's poem, For the Time Being, which is a Christmas oratorio. He says, we who must die demand a miracle, right? We who are trapped in this mortality need something from outside ourselves because we're lost in the woods without it. But fortunately, God is merciful and he did not turn away. If you, if you keep reading, actually, the next chapter after this is great because God kind of comes back and he's like, I was listening to everything you said. I haven't hidden, I haven't run away. I would like to say some things as well. He said, I haven't been hiding. You've been just too busy running after everything else. You have greed and sex and money and power and war and all these things and you, you can't hear me when I have been reaching out to you all these years. But he did not do what they expect. He says, um, you did awesome things that we did not expect. God's action is always surprising. It's never quite what we expect or what we want. He didn't rip open the heavens and blow everything up. He came quietly in the form of a baby. And I know we've all heard that story our whole lives, but that is still so surprising that he comes not like this avenging conqueror, but gently. And you know the next time when it talks about the heavens being ripped open is at Christ's baptism. He sees the heavens open and the spirit descends on him like a dove and God says, you are my beloved son. With you I am well pleased. So God didn't rip open the heavens to blast everybody. He ripped open the heavens to come in love and to commission his son to walk among us, to be one of us. He's still a potter. He's still shaping us, shaping our lives into what he wants. But his keeping of his promise then is a marker that he will continue to work in us and in our world until he comes to set all things right. In the meantime, we wait, and Advent is a time of, of hopeful, active waiting. It doesn't just mean like, well, eventually God will do something, so it doesn't matter if we take care of our world now, or it doesn't care, matter how I behave now, or it doesn't matter how I treat my neighbors or my community now. No, we, we should work for goodness and rightness and peace in our homes, in our jobs, in our neighborhoods, and our, our countries, and in our world. But we don't work as if it all depends on us. We work knowing that the God who these people prayed to did keep his promise to come again, and he didn't come with anger to blow them away like crumpled, dead, dry, flammable leaves, but with love and kindness. As we take the communion meal in a little while, that meal is not only a reminder of Christ's coming and giving himself for us 2,000 years ago, but it's also a meal to nourish and strengthen us and keep us going in the long waiting because just as Christmas will eventually come, so too will the Advent when all of this will be made right. Let's pray. God, you've given us this language of lament and you've preserved it in your scriptures so that we can cry out and know that we're not alone in saying we want this world to be Fixed. We are tired of greed and war and foolishness, not just way out there somewhere, but in ourselves as well. And we admit that we are not clean. We are not seeking after you as we should. And, and um, some of the suffering that we experience, we've even brought on ourselves. But you are the Father who has not given up on us. You are the potter who is still working with his creation. And so, knowing that you kept your promise to send the Messiah once, we look forward with hope and confidence that you will complete your work of making everything right. Help us not to get so numb to the way the world is and not to give up, but to keep that holy dissatisfaction because after the bad news, we believe that there is good news. In Christ's name.
This next song is new to us. Um, it's based on Psalm 37, and it's by Wendell Kimbrough. Uh, we've done some other songs by him at church before. Um, so the first verse, Mike's going to sing it, kind of teach us the tune, and then join in as you as you learn it. <coughs>
when heaven and earth pass away, your words will never pass away. Like a potter, you created the, work, the earth and we are all the work of your hands. At your presence, even the mountains quake, and yet to those who wait for you, you are the light, revealing our salvation. In your child, Jesus, you have come among us, teaching us to live in readiness for your reign. Though he was killed, you raised him to life, restoring to us the light of your presence and enriching us with all your gifts as we await the day when he, when he comes in glory to bring this world to its final home. Let us proclaim the mystery of faith. If you drink wine, you'll notice the wine is a little bit sharper and drier. If you eat the bread, you'll notice that it has ginger and other very sharp, visceral spices in it. The idea of this is to remind us that we're in this place of longing and waiting and recognizing the need for Jesus to come in the first place. Um, we encourage you to gather around the tables with each other. But if you are not ready for that today, we have the rail open, and we also do have supplies up here for folks who want to take it directly back to their seat. Just be careful of the Advent candle, please. Don't do anything dangerous. Um, as Justin reminded us, the world right now and always is a crumbling mess, and so much of that rubble lives and rattles around in each one of us. Sometimes it feels like the darkness has snuffed out the light, but God sees and in seeing, God takes action. What we can't do, God does for us. And he does it so gently and so humbly that if we're not paying attention and we're not looking carefully, we might miss it. We might miss the fullness of God communing with us in the body of his son, Jesus. But fear not, beloved children, because this table is set to remind us that light has broken in that Christ has broken in, and that he restores and empowers us to join with God in the work of making all things fully alive, even us. If you need that reminder today, this table is for you. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, and having broken it, he gave thanks, and he said, this bread is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat it, remember me. And in the same way, after dinner, he took the cup and said, This cup is a new covenant, poured out by my blood. Whenever you drink this, remember me. Because as often as we eat this bread and we drink this wine, we proclaim that Christ has died in our place. We proclaim that Christ is alive and at work in us and in the world right now. And we proclaim that until he completes his work of peace and restoration. The table is open.
Please stand and let's sing our final song. Um, Come, thou long expected Jesus. Thank you.